everybody. The revolution is an annual question. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. As usual, let us recite the mantra of the universe in its purity, Om Nam, seven times as we begin. Please. what kind of taste the food has. Or when you sleep and you have good dreams or no dreams at all, then you had a good sleep and you wake up and you are refreshed and you feel good. Fame is very tricky because it really gives you the high of human attention. And under the header of fame there is also what we call power, because if many people pay attention to you and you are in some media and many people know your name, you tend to believe you are more than them. It's a general fallacy, the general mistake that famous people make. They believe they are more than those who are not famous. They also believe sometimes that the rules do not apply to them. And that's where they make those mistakes that are pretty hard to correct. It takes a long time, it takes a lot of recognition, a lot of effort. Chemistry between human beings that results in a relationship, that's, ob that's also obvious. And if you look at human body and mind, at least in the human body you can detect very clearly what kind of chemicals, what kind of hormones, or what kind of fluids, or whatever, are generated by each of the five desires. And since we are sentient beings, body and mind together, as a definition of sentient being, physical body with a human mind. That's us, humans. A physical body with animal mind, that's animals. But because we experience this world through the body, mostly, unless you practice and you go beyond that, these experiences are also defined by their chemistry. So you, if you eat bad food, you really don't want that anymore because the taste is bad and your body tells you maybe this food is not so good for me. Maybe I get poisoned or I have to go to the hospital and you know, treat myself. Likewise, when you have a bad dream and you sleep in the wrong way, your body wakes up and your mind wakes up in the morning. It just wasn't 
the right balance of all the emotions and everything associated with it. So my sleep was important. Or when you are not famous but, in, but infamous, and you have the wrong things you know, circulating, then fame can easily turn into a nightmare. So you can see how chemistry operates. And we have to be aware of that. Why? Because these can have, these kind of chemistry or chemical experiences, these can have very powerful effects on our lives. In other words, we can become dependent on them. Currently, psychology has a very interesting concept, relationship dependency. That you're totally dependent on a certain relationship, and without a certain person, you cannot imagine your life. You know, kids are attached to food, you know. I'm not sure what Korean kids are crazy about, but Hungarian kids, you know, were crazy about noodles. So, if they didn't get at least a few dishes of noodles per week, they were very unhappy. But when, when we become adults, our behavior doesn't really change. We are still dependent. Sometimes on people's attention, sometimes on people's intimacy, sometimes very, very stupid and childish things, but yet we are adults and we want them, we follow them. And if we cannot balance our chemistry, what do we do? We take other chemicals called meditation. So when people are totally and absolutely depressed, they take some medicine to balance the chemistry of their consciousness. Or when their consciousness is broken, then there are other chemicals that try to reduce the effect of all those compounded thoughts and feelings that make a person crazy. The message here today is that you cannot correct chemicals with chemicals. So if you do not have a good relationship and the chemistry between you and your significant other is bad, you cannot just take another medicine or alcohol or some other substances to correct them. Somehow we would have to go beyond this. Whether we have hair on our heads or not. And going beyond means becoming free from chemicals. Becoming independent of chemistry. And this is not the exact same idea as, you know, complete detachment, seclusion, purity, sanctity or all these high spiritual concepts because these themselves have also some kind of I. The biggest fallacy or the mistake of the Arahan is that I am pure or I am liberated. And as long as this I is there, there is no purity and there is no liberation. Have you asked yourselves why do we have to be born so many times on this earth and maybe on some other places and in some other kinds of bodies? Why do we want the chemical experience again and again and again? I let you sit with this. Go deep inside and really find out what's the ultimate reason or the use of repeating these experiences, generating certain feelings thoughts, experiences, why? And if you look deep inside, you try to find what is it that generates this? What is it that goes through this? What do you find? What's the ultimate reason? You'll find a bunch of habits. You'll see your karma. You'll see how they are interrelated. Your motivations, your sense of self, your desires, your anger, how they are interrelated. But do you find a single entity that does all this? That's why we practice with the question, what is this that does all this, wants all this, suffers all this? Because when you direct the energy towards that question, the focus of your life can change. And the focus stops being on some chemical balance or on some good taste or good feeling or perfect attention from others. It stops wanting that. It goes back to the root of all the cycles of 
lives and deaths that we have covered just to have the ultimate fulfillment experience. Looking at the world as it is today is not pleasant. You see so much suffering on one single web page that is just blowing your mind. So how can we exist like this? And the only answer is that we are attached to our habits. We are attached to all the chemistry that we have between the world and us, other humans and us, and within our bodies. So if we were not attached to all this, we could become independent. But we human beings are extremely skillful at devising new ways of being dependent and making others dependent. So the Buddha's teaching just tells you about the five desires, but it doesn't tell you about internet, television, video games, etc., etc. So it seems that the more we evolve as human beings, and the more sophisticated material structures we can devise, the more sophisticated our mental dependencies become. Look at that. What did you need a thousand years ago to make a human being happy? One single human being. What did you need 500 years ago, 50 years ago, 5 years ago, and now? Drastically different. So, when human beings' minds were really more simple, maybe also more clear, but not much, then it was easier to become happy. Now, the chemistry is much more complicated because our thinking is a lot more complicated. So if you go back from the chemical experience, from the sensory experience, you take one more step back to find the emotions that are satisfied by this chemistry, whatever it is in the five classic realms of desire. You make one more step back and there are the thoughts that plug into these emotions and find themselves warm, satisfied, only given refuge. And if you take one more step even deeper, you find a sense of self that generates all these based on previous habits, based on the past, generates a present and projects a future. And here the teaching says that if you do not return to the mind which is even before this thinking, the saying is that complete don't know. And you do not find the roots and cannot take out the root causes of the five desires. If you have five kinds of desire, you also have five kinds of anger, when you don't get what you want. So look at the way we behave in these five realms, and we have the desire and anger associated with it. Two people love each other very much. They spend day and night together, they have wedlock, they have children, they have everything, and one day, something doesn't work out, and the desire energy that attracted them turns into anger. Big anger, small anger, doesn't matter. Sustained, complete detachment, or even harmful intentions towards one another. We call that poison relationship. And anybody who's an adult went through it, either short time or long time, and went through the pain of releasing the bondage which seemed so wonderful at first, manageable in the middle, and untenable and completely incongruous at the end. If you reverse this towards the teaching of beginning and end, it works exactly in the same way. We begin something because we want to do it. We find a way to sustain it. And somehow when things fall apart, then we become upset, angry, and desire something else or someone else. And that relationship then ends, and something new appears. The Oriental and Western behavior about these are drastically different, yet if you look at the number of divorces in Korea, it's highly increasing. So the individualistic behavior, the behavior that focuses on the self primarily, and how do I feel good? How do I become happy? That's becoming more and more prevalent. We human beings not only have the potential to wake up, but we also have the potential to create different culture, different relationships. Therefore, reducing the amount of suffering 
associated with these five and other desires. And I bring the focus back to the digital desires of our time because now, not just kids, but also adults, if you look at the subway, they are playing the same games as their sons and daughters. And they don't really take care of each other in the evening, or mentally, emotionally, sometimes having a longer conversation, what actually went on on that day. What actually happened in the mind or soul of the person sitting right next to you at the same kitchen table. But they do it just like a business meeting. Five minutes, the most important points. Everything's okay? No problem? Yes. So that's it. Let's watch TV and then knock ourselves out for the night. Finish. And that's how human relationships deteriorate. We pay less attention to each other at an everyday simple level. We pay attention to the famous people, we pay attention to some satisfaction, we pay attention to the food, of course, and we want to sleep very well, and we want to have enough money in the budget, but when do we really sit down and meet each other? When do we really listen to each other? When do we really want to make sure the other person is happy, and not primarily us? And in fact, when do we reach the stage when the other person's happiness means our happiness? Now, for that, you have to have some selfless bodhisattva mind so that this would happen. Otherwise, we'll be interested only in some chemical states. States of happiness that are defined by our own chemistry, by our own balance or imbalance of materials, alkaloids, other kinds of stuff right in our bodies, which affect our minds. And what is it? Especially sad and has to be in our focus when we make decisions whether we are not entering another dependency just by wanting to be free. And the drug use of the West and sometimes also in, in Asia means especially this problem. Those people in the hippie era in the 60s and the 70s and onwards spreading like wildfire, not just in the US but also in Europe and elsewhere where it became possible, in South America, they wanted to become free. They wanted to be absolutely uh, rid of their own small self. So they literally catapulted their consciousness from their bodies into another realm. And it took them years sometimes to realize that that's even more suffering than the conventional small self that they wanted to depart from. We call it drug abuse. And by now, a whole generation knows, in fact, two generations know that this is not the solution, yet it's on the increase, at least in the West. So that's why another chemical state is not the solution for a primarily wrong chemical state in the first this is very important and we must remember this. Balance is necessary, but freedom cannot be attained by becoming more dependent than before. And it is also very unfortunate that there is a significant amount of human beings that are interested in creating these dependencies, that are interested in the sale and distribution of controlled substances, not just as you see in the movies, but also in mainstream society with you know, medication that, that's available or other substances that can make you feel happy for a short time but in the long run you are in jail. You are totally incarcerated by the chemical environment and you have to pay for it. First with your money, then with your social status, then your social relationships, then with your life. So. It's serious. Life can be very, very good, but it's not fun. It's very serious because we have limited time on this earth. We have many dangers that can actually harm us. And if we are ignorant, we can harm others by our unfinished, unseen part. So again, what's the medicine? What's the medicine which is not chemistry? What's the medicine which doesn't have a substance? That's your mind. 
that is originally free from life and death. That's your mind, which is originally before thinking. That's your true self, that can wake up and become free from all the material or chemical dependencies of your life. And then you can keep everything to the necessary extent. I'm not saying minimum or maximum. Some people have famous karma, some people have infamous karma, some people have not famous karma. All these three are actually empty. All these three are without good or bad. But what, whether you have it or not, that matters. Because if you have it, you have to do it. The other four you know, major areas operate exactly in the same way. So now we looked at awakening from this purely chemical point of view. So wake up from the cloud of whatever you have in your body and your mind. Because another cloud will not help. Right? So I think for introduction this is plenty. I can already see the eyes and the minds you know, moving the right direction. And uh, if you have any questions, we opened up many gates and many subjects. You're very welcome to ask them. For sure, the human is basically a uh, consist of mind and then body. Maybe it can be one. If you control your body using the medicine, you can control your mind. For example, your brain I mean, uh, can be uh, like controlled by some kind of medicine or some kind of acupuncture. So mind and then uh, uh, body, maybe, I mean material things, uh, is the basic. And the mind can be controlled by the I mean, material uh, things. How can you show human beings are basically consistent with that? Well, you've just said it. So if there are two things that can be controlled with chemicals, body and mind, then they must exist. And your question is whether they are one and the same or not. And uh, basically, I can give you one important example that happens about twice every second on this earth, it's death. So when we die, something's missing. But the body is there. So the body is there, but something is definitely missing. So whatever is missing makes us incapable of using our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and thinking or brain anymore. So something's definitely not there. We can call that consciousness or not. It's a very good example, but it's undeniable. If your body is like die and then you hurt I mean consciousness also I mean, go away and then you your body go back to the nature and then nature itself repeat. Where does your consciousness go? I mean consciousness can be the reaction of the materials. I mean chemistry inside the body. Can be, but is it? I'm, I don't know, I mean, that's why I'm asking. Very good, keep that going on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm asking, how are you so sure? I mean, our consciousness leave our body when we die, and then go back to, I mean, take all the bodies and then live on again? How can you sure about that? <laughs> well, well, I'm just a Buddhist monk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, without that, can Buddhist uh, I mean, survive. I mean, we, maybe we don't need that. I mean, for the Buddhism. I mean, Buddhism itself is very nice, and then meditation is also good. That is kind of meta metic, uh, Like, uh, we don't need. Do, do you really need that? I mean, to that is like um, that's the main heart of the Buddhism, or no. No, the main heart of Buddhism is asking the right question. That's why I asked, are you sure? The main question is, if there is a mind, what is it? But if there's no mind, then what is it that's speaking from your mouth? What is it that sees with your eyes, hears with your ears? What is it that thinks all your, all your thoughts? What is it? Tell me. Can be chemical reaction. 
I'm not saying can be, can be chemical reaction, can be an act of God, can be put together by all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. I mean, we are very good at making concepts and making possibilities. It's exactly the experience that you are referring to, which I also believe that we need. And I also believe that you must ask the right question to get the right experience. So if there's a mind, what is it? Is there a mind? So what is what is it that thinks mind or no mind? That's what we are looking for, right? Something thinks inside, otherwise it wouldn't happen, correct? You can direct your thoughts. What is it that directs your thoughts? What is it that directs your choices? What is it that tells you, okay, tonight we eat kimbap, tomorrow we eat chapche, next day we eat chongucha. So what is it that you love, huh? Me too. So what do you... What is it that decides within you? I, mean, I cannot prove it, I mean just believe. So belief cannot be enough. Of course. But do you need an external and material proof of something which is primarily not sensual and not material? How could you do that? So again, you have to ask the right question. If you want to have a scientific approach which is primarily non-scientific, it's not gonna work. It's like trying to drive with a car on a mountain path. You just have no space. Okay, so what is it that asks the question, mind or no mind? What is it that thinks with your mind, feels with your heart? And you don't have to be a Buddhist to find the answer as an experience to that. In fact, sometimes it's better not to have any religion, any belief at all. Just ask very sincerely inside and you can make that your practice. I'm not going to tell you yes or no. Why would I? You have to wake up to your own answer. And when you do that, then you can come back here and say, Sunim, I found it! Then we check it out. Okay. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. You talked about when, for example, we care more about things than people. I guess it relates to the concept of compassion. Would you share some of your thoughts about compassion? Thank you. Uh, you opened up a wonderful subject about compassion. And uh, first of all, I have to say that we uh, need to clear up this concept of compassion pretty much. Especially for Westerners, the Oriental way of thinking about compassion is like a newborn child that has to be really washed up well and fed well and taken care of so they can become the correct adult person. Mostly, Westerners believe that feeling good things or having good emotions towards another person, that's compassion. It's true, but to a very little extent. Very little. Or compassion means that you give somebody something that they need. Like you see a beggar and you give them chonon or ochanon and then you did the right thing. Yeah, you did. You did. You did the right thing. But is that the entirety of compassion? And the answer is no, it's a very small part of it. So how can you grasp the entirety of compassion? Strangely enough, it doesn't come from emotions, it doesn't come from thinking, it comes from a much deeper experience, which our first question also referred to. Whatever we have as our deepest, truest self is exactly the same. Now, once you experience that, you have compassion. That your mind and my mind, your Buddha nature, my Buddha nature, all beings' Buddha nature is the same. And that is an experience which can only come through some realization, either formal practice or some break from the normal dualistic mind. When you have that, then you deeply experience that my substance and your substance is the same substance. So if your mind can really cut off dualistic thoughts and return to before thinking, dualistic emotions and return before feelings, then you can truly see and perceive and attain that your true self and all beings true self is exactly the same. So in other words, you and the world became one. You as a drop of water returned to the ocean. And you experienced the ocean because you became the ocean. 
And out of this deep experience comes everything else. Because if the beggar doesn't have food, you don't have food. If somebody's unhappy, you are unhappy. If somebody's harmed, you are harmed. So that's a very deep teaching on compassion, which is not based on emotions, not based on thinking. It's based on the attainment of our true nature, which is identical in each one of us. Otherwise, we couldn't get it. We couldn't attain it, and we couldn't feel compassionate to one another. It wouldn't work. This is not something that you can mentally generate all of that. You can see the attitude of compassion, which is different from true compassion. Compassion is not an attitude. So, it's very simple. When people make compassion inside their minds, it usually ends up in disaster. They want to be compassionate based on some concept, and as we know it, the road to hell is paved with good intention. Why we actually get there, if we get there, is a deeper cause than just good intentions. So an awakened consciousness naturally manifests compassion because attain the highest and truest wisdom, which is our substance. When that happens, there's compassion without thinking, without making anything in your mind without having a specific attitude or concept how I should behave to help this world. So that's why practicing is very important and don't expect you know this perfect and instantaneous thing right away because then you just frustrate yourself. I've been meditating for years and I still feel tremendously angry towards many people. Why does that happen? Well, maybe hundreds of lifetimes of habits do not disappear in just a few years. Maybe we have to have a very sustained and clear attitude and approach to practice. And that practice generates more than just an attitude, more than just a behavior pattern. So human beings are very easily conditioned on the surface. You know, you can put on a new makeup, a mask or whatever, and you look at the mirror. Wow, I'm a different person. The makeup is gone, the mask is taken off, and the same old thing is staring back at you. Well, that's what we are dealing with when we are practicing. And that's why many people don't like practicing, because you see the same old thing, always, all the time. But somehow something does happen, because as you see it, you disengage from it, you stop being identified with it, you, you do not attach to it anymore. And when that mind baggage, that trash, that karma, which is really burdening you, is gone, you become more free, more authentic, more yourself. And not your perceived ego as self, but your true self, which has no I, no me, no mind. And when that happens, compassion naturally manifests because you cannot not help. It comes. And that's what we are looking for. Every single walk of life in any society, true compassion is based on this substantial experience and part of our relationship, not on some kind of concept which is verified by a bureau as a budget goes there and somehow weapons appear in a few moments because you can't do what you want. So compassion is more than emotions, more than thoughts, and it's not just you know, an action. Sometimes really listening to somebody, having a clear mirror-like consciousness, and that very, very <clears throat> tender heart is just what's necessary to fix the relationship. But you cannot fix with talking, you have to fix with silence. So compassion has many, many ways of manifesting, but can only be genuine by a genuine experience of non-self. The new and this world become one, and spontaneously, without thinking, we're helping assemble some mind of yours. Thank you for your question. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, I was uh, just thinking about everything that's been said so far. Um, you know, we said we were talking about the spiritual rebirth and um. To me? Know, well, no. We were. Somebody was talking about oh, the, yeah. the rebirth. Uh, you know, and it, it was a big topic. Yeah, you hit a couple points on there. And I was thinking, wow. You know, the 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 eyes of reborn uh, of a person dying and then being reborn is you know. 
on Earth we think you know of it as you know a shutout. You know, it's like maybe a trillion to one that you know after after we die or whatever, we just it's you know it's we're gone. You know, we're history. Uh, we're the, we're on the History Channel. But then what I'm thinking is why is it why are these odds so bad? Why is the odds of rebirth more rebirth so bad? Well, then I then I was kept on listening to you talk. I was thinking, okay, this gentleman was asking you about the reborn issue of the spiritual life. And what I was trying to think, I was thinking about the, uh, a boat, you know, just a little boat on the water. Now that's that's kind of like our our how would you say our freedom of spirit, you know, is like you know there you know when we die there might be something better. But then once you start putting rocks in that boat, it's like doubt. You know, and more more rocks you put in that boat, it's gonna sink, obviously. And that's you know, and and that's that's kind of like uh, a lot of people's you know attitudes in the world. It's kind of like you know the, the the boat's already sunk. You know, there's so much doubt. I've already placed right on you know the question of death and life that the boat's already on the bottom of the ocean. You know, so what it what it what it is is that you know how I think of this spiritual thing and um, the, the Buddhism or this you know the you know this denomination is like it's actually a spirit that actually stays on top of the water you know just like in the Western culture like Jesus Christ you know we walk on water so it's like you know the whole reason behind uh, Buddha thing and for me and spirituality and uh, rebirth and uh, death and life is that you don't put rocks in the boat right away you know uh, in in uh, you know when somebody asks you do you believe in God or do you believe in you know heaven or this you know automatically most people are going to put rocks about maybe 50 pounds a thousand pounds of rocks on that question and say no you know there's there's no way I believe in hell or believe in anything about this nature but see that's that's because so many people have so many rocks to give a, you know to put in their boat right away so the whole the whole question is that Okay, if I'm going to take my boat from this, from A to B, from across the water, you know, you can't put any rocks in there, you know, and that's like this journey between, you know, like the King Tut, you know, journey from, from the life to, the af to death to afterlife, you know, this ship has to go, you know, sail from death to another life, and once I start putting rocks in that boat, it's not going to go across. Okay. What's so, your yeah. question? Oh, no, no, so that, that's basically the, the whole philosophy behind the doubt in we the already we, understand that. Yes, yes we so. need we need your question <laughs> to begin with. Oh okay the, no the the question I was just trying to uh, simulate with the the conversation. You have to do your job as an audience so yeah. I can do my <laughs> job as a <laughs> So rehashing his philosophy is yeah. great yeah. with a cup of tea. Yes. But uh, I need your question and openness to be able to answer. You have said plenty. And yeah. I respond to that. Oh no, no, no. I was just trying to so, simulate with the conversation that we were that was taking place. Sorry. <laughs> so basically, the rocks in the boat are all the wrong views that bind you down. But if you want to use your metaphor really well, then it's point A to point B is not from death to another life or from life to death. It's really going beyond the cycle of life and death. Asking questions, actually, if you ask the right questions, it makes the load easier because the rocks are the wrong views and the questions are actually the hand that lift those rocks, examine them, and they say, this is not part of the book, it's some dead weight. So you throw your wrong views into the water. Likewise, if you say there is mind, wrong view. If you say there is no mind, it's also wrong view, throw that away. The correct question, is there mind or not? Or what is it that asks this question? That's a question which throws all the wrong views out and keeps the boat very light. Not only that, it can blow all the wrong views, it can take out all the ballast weight or the dead weight, and after a while, as you also hinted at, you won't need the boat. You can just cruise. And you are above the water of life and death. You go beyond 
you know, the forced existence in the six realms. It is possible, but for that, a question is necessary. Yes. So the doubts, the doubts are very correct. But what's the response to the doubt? Usually, people make up things when they don't know it. Okay? And when you make it up, instead of verified by some experience, then it becomes dead weight because it's not true. It's an idea. So the idea of Buddha, the idea of God, the idea of perfection, the idea of Nirvana, it's all dead weight. And Zen means take that away. And when you do, your boat becomes super light and it cruises absolutely smooth on the water. And then you realize you have no boat. You have no boundaries. There's seven billion people that can ferry across if and only if they throw out all the dead weight, all the wrong views, and if they dare to ask, ask the questions. So, you have good energy, good courage. Never stop asking. Focus on one question and let that be your guide like a light post or a beacon. And that question helps you. The moment some idea appears, the moment some definitive name and form answer appears, throw it back to the water where it came from. Okay? Very good. Next. Any kind of question is good. You don't have to be a Buddhist, or a materialist, a believer, or a non-believer. Anything is okay. external verification, good and bad, okay? First of all, what we must realize is the three kinds of I. The first is imperfection, means with an I. Next is impermanence, and the other is interdependence, okay? So there's nobody as a single person and no organization that will ever be perfect. So the imperfection of individuals as well as an organization were exposed. Are they alone with that? Are they the only one? And everything and everyone else is perfect. So, it's a general human situation. People love to see things the way they want to see them, and when reality comes in, they say, oh my God, what happened? Well, we up. We are living in an imperfect, impermanent, and interdependent world. Next, if you really want to see this clearly, you have to have a clear mind. In other words, if you rush to conclusions and rush to judgments, your clarity is obscured by your own dualistic thinking and your own emotions. If you treat this in your own adult way, you ask one question. What do I have to do with all this? What is my job? What is my relationship in this situation? Can I help them? Or I can only help myself? So, we are dependent on each other's approval. We are dependent on each other's actions. So, in your case, as you are a sincere Buddhist, I presume, because otherwise you wouldn't ask the question about the finger and being rocking yeah. and pointing to the moon. 
What is my job as a sincere Buddhist in this situation? How can I help? And everybody in such, you know, storm of events, if we realize our true job and true relationship to this situation, we can actually help. I learned one thing in Korea. It's an old Confucianist, you know, approach to anything like this. It's a sh it was a shock to Westerners when we first learned about this. But when you see anything which is really controversial, really giving space to judgments, then you ask, where is my mistake? Where is my mistake? This is not a guilt trip. This is not diverting the subject. This is not shifting focus. This is using your situation or the surrounding situation to become an adult. To become really a more awakened person. So, where's my mistake? And once you find it and correct that, you became a better person. And in fact, the situation helped you. Those monks doing all those things, they helped you. But if you don't, you rush to judgments and conclusions and etc. etc. Then you make your situation worse. You actually downgraded your own path. I'm not saying there was no mistake there. But if you're attached to that mistake, that mistake you know, kills you. That mistake can kill your path. So, what can you actually do? You can associate with people that you trust, and you can do things that you have reason to believe in. And I wish that all of us would have the courage to do so, and continue to do so. So if you can spare yourself from your own guilt trip or judging others, if you can spare yourself from becoming totally dualistic, good and bad, about situations outside, you can also do that, non-judgment or clear consciousness inside. Was there a mistake? Yes, there was. Can you correct it? No, only they can correct it. So, staying absolutely clear about this, seeing your own situation and your own relationship, you can have correct function here and you can use their mistake so that you grow on the path. If you're attached to the mistake, then that can kill you, that can downgrade your path because you make more suffering for yourself and others. Okay. I don't suffer. No? I just I'm not saying you do, but you can if you relate to this in the wrong way. If not, you can help others. And you can even help them, although indirectly. I have a following back question. I just trying to this. How do you, well, I'm not yet, but how, how do you differentiate guilt from shame? Oh. Basically, compared to shame, guilt is very objective. There is a very clear line of cause and effect and guilt can be established or a mistake. I actually do not use these these terms not too much but shame is an emotional state. Sometimes you can be ashamed even when there is no guilt and some people are not ashamed even when they are guilty. Okay, So shame is a negative emotional reaction when you downgrade yourself and your self-esteem is very low and you feel very bad and you don't want to share your face. Sometimes you see on Korean television you know even we don't know whether they are guilty or not, but they're just captured on camera uh, with some cardboard boxes, and as they are pulled out, you know, they cover their face and they, they go like that completely, and they don't want to show their faces because of, we don't know whether they are guilty or not. I mean, the best was that, <laughs> I'll never forget this. We are in some Mogyok town, you know, finishing our bath, and we feel very happy, and, and you know, in every Mogyok town, there's a television, and it, goes on and the Sajak is sitting there in the way in the whole day. And what happened was that there was a, an arrest. And this arrest took place in an office. And all you saw was people lying flat on the couch, covering their entire heads with their shirts or coats. And all you saw is it, it was like a science fiction movie with a special bacteria where everybody died flat on the table. <laughs> and all they could shoot was people, you know, hunched over their desks, and that's it. Finished. That's shame. 
And guilt is something that you admit that you have done wrong. Do you need a separate Buddhist point of view? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't give you that. I mean, there are so many books, and if you want Buddhist concept, I'm, I'm just giving you the general version. Which is Well, in this case, well, if you want my relationship to this, you know, in this case, I don't feel guilty, but I feel ashamed. I wasn't there, I didn't do this, but they are my fellow Buddhist monks, so I feel ashamed. And I feel very sorry. Well, it's about my job. There's something go something going a really wrong way. And so I got stressed out a lot. But so um but uh, I was trying to say something right, but people said that if you say something then I'm not gonna listen to you, so it's gonna be useless. So but I I'm so suffering because uh, I need to do something for it, but you know, but I do know that I I haven't seen that nothing has changed. Because, you know, when some people are about talking about it, so, um, so do you think that uh, if there is no any, uh, if there, uh, if there won't, uh, won't be any changes, uh, do I have to do something right in my uh, workplace? What you ask is very general. So if you ask a general question, you get a general answer. If you want to be more specific, I don't want to know names, I'm not interested in personal details, but if you give me kind of more bony question that means more concrete, mm -hmm. I can give you a more concrete answer. Okay. Uh, so I'm a teacher, but uh, the, the employers, uh, you're, not, uh, you're not treated fairly, mm -hmm. so we don't get paid enough. And some, uh, some, some, some things are against the law, mm -hmm. but nobody's uh, talk, uh, nobody's, uh, no, uh, people are afraid of talking about it because we get some uh, disadvantages of saying something. Yeah. But I do know that because uh, the, the employer's power is much more stronger. Oh yeah, yeah. these days of yeah. course. So, so whatever we do, they're not going to listen to us. But I'm the only one, or I can, or two or three, just few people can talk about it and mm -hmm. uh, complain about it or say something right about it. So then, but I do know that they are not gonna listen to us. But I'm suffering because I I do nothing for it. But I still are uh, complaining about it. You're very enthusiastic, and that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but enthusiasm and courage. They are not always the same. So to be courageous, you have to have some kind of clear approach to this whole situation. First of all, is this job important for you? That means can you afford to lose it or not? That's something you have to answer for yourself. Number two, it matters a lot whether you are alone or already two or three people share your views. And the other third question that I would like you to focus on you said some people are afraid to talk about it. Are these the employers or the employees? There's a huge difference between them. In other words, is the management accessible? At least do they listen or do they at least pretend to listen? Or there's a complete stone wall that you don't get an appointment, your, your letters are not answered, whatever. So you have to really see your purpose with this and what you can afford to lose doing this achieving this purpose. I'm not saying that you have to have a mass demonstration near Kwan Kwan Wen, you know, but you need allies, you need friends, you need people you can trust. And if that happens, then that environment as it is, is ripe for a change. This ripeness is in the minds and hearts. If people don't trust your views and therefore don't trust you, if people don't want to follow the direction that, you know, could be worked out by some process and means they haven't woken up certain things 
either they haven't woken up to this suffering which you already experience or they haven't woken up to the potential to change it so maybe more suffering is necessary so what is the threshold when they say I had enough this cannot go on like this anymore finish it so this is something you alone cannot feel and cannot direct you need friends, you need allies, and you need the whole group or the majority of the group trusting you or trusting each other. Better be not as the primary leader of a rebellion in the workplace, especially not in Korea. I remember very vividly when the bus lines were renumbered. Everybody who lives in Seoul for longer than six, seven years remember that there was this huge demonstration of bus drivers. For instance, the bus that used to be number 84 is now 151. The one that used to be 5-2 is another, you know, beginning with one and goes to Shinshin Botari. So, what happened was that about three, four thousand bus drivers organize themselves almost like an army. I have never seen anything like this, especially not in the West. In the West, there's this kind of faceless, disorganized demonstration with some slogans and shouting and maybe a couple of thousand people, maybe even more, but it's not organized. It's not like this massive force that is completely conscious of itself as individuals and the group. But here, I'll never forget, we were invited to a Buddhist opera this Buddhist performance of Ichadon, you know, remember that, this Buddhist saint. And uh, the theater was near Dongguk University. And as we got out of the subway, there was tear gas. Tear gas. And we went up, and we couldn't believe it. The whole thing looked like a battlefield, and people with red headbands and white writing on the headbands with steel sticks this long, they were running, marching, like a, like a military unit. And they set things, you know, not everything on fire, but they had fires burning where they warmed themselves. It was many days, like three, four days. And they marched like an army. They acted completely in an organized way. I've never seen anything like this. A unit of like 20, 30 people in rows of three, they were just like a tank right next to us. They were commanded, you know, to go somewhere. Another was just standing by, hundreds of people with steel sticks you know, on the right you know, to protect themselves against the police papers. And that's the demonstration. And what happened? The bus lines were renumbered. There was a deal made above their heads. The demonstration was called off. Everybody went back to work. They restored the park. The fires were out. The headbands were taken off. Finished. I'm not saying this is not an option. Usually, revolution is not an evolution. Somehow, human beings make it. Somehow, we cannot live without manifesting our own frustration or anger or discontent, however you know, organized it was, because there was no property damaged, there was nobody injured or let alone killed. So it was a very high-class demonstration in that sense. There was, of course, big cleanup to be done, but no property damage and no human injuries. Nothing. All right? But what did they achieve? They achieved that they showed their strength, and I remember it right now, you know, many years you know, down the line. But they couldn't stop the renumbering of the lines. So if the leadership's mind is not somehow positively involved, if you cannot convince them of your point, maybe putting most of the workforce on your side, it's hopeless. I mean, the world is in this situation. We have seven billion people and the lower two the lowest two billion doesn't have enough water and enough food. Does it make a difference in the minds of those that make decisions about big financial and political decisions? No. Not now. Maybe when when we have three billion people, we start to think. When it comes to their doorstep, they accept that it exists. When it's four or five billion people in extreme poverty or hundreds of millions already dying, then that may cross the line, exceed the threshold. So ask yourself this question, can you afford to lose this job? Do you have any friends 
can you make them into allies? Can you have a peaceful engagement, but based on a majority, like a decisive majority that can change the leadership's mind? If you cannot put the leadership onto your side, it's hopeless. Did this help? Very well. More questions? It's wonderful what we've got today. Continue. something like she talking about they threaten us that we might lose job yes because everybody has especially not me but a lot of people has to need a job to support their parents or kids so job is like essential it's like the key words for average people so if, the, if we treat it badly at work if society is something terribly going on I mean, in our heart, we want to do something about it, but in reality, we cannot do much because because for us, is keeping the job is the most important thing. I, I mean, every people. You, but but I, I also want to kind of put some light at your options because I believe in changes, although not external and not just society social changes because my country especially went through many many social changes in the last 150 years and we didn't become any better out of that so that's why we focus on the mind that the mind has to change and that changes the notion of the individual that changes the notion of family that changes society as well so there's no deep change quality change inside the mind you cannot change effectively society why we had Sorry to be engaged in just in Hungarian history. We had the 1848 revolution against the Habsburgs. It was a mistake. We should have talked to them. But they crushed us with some big Russian force. They invited 200,000 soldiers. Rebellion and revolution and war of independence was over. Eventually, in 1867, we made a complete social truce with them because we realized we are in such a situation that we cannot exist without one another. So we shook hands in 1867, almost 20 years later, and we created what we call the dualistic kingdom. Okay, so one empire, two kingdoms. It existed until the First World War. The First World War, somebody at near the end came up in 1919 with the idea of communism in Hungary. That communist republic was valid and alive for 133 days, but it did so much damage, it, it almost decapitated, you know, Hungary, Hungary's leadership, completely eroded its international stature, and uh, great losses, human and other losses, came out of that. In the Second World War, Hungary wanted to get back its lost territories based on the First World War's no peace treaties, with peace treaties, and we got the wrong alliance. We sided with Nazi Germany at that time. That's not what people wanted, that's what the leadership wanted. So based on that, we got really totally erased during the Second World War, and it was decided in Yalta that the Russians can come as far as Vienna, occupying Hungary, but not any further to the west. So by Russian influence, we became communists, just like North Korea became communist, you know, by Russian influence. All I'm talking about is social changes. 
1956, we made a revolution because we really, really suffered. I mean, that's what I'm talking about when, I, when really there's no food, there's no hope, people are dirt poor, and jobs are very low, pays are very low, and there's not enough food or basic commodities in the shops. And people just went out to the streets and they made a big revolution, enough. What happened? 200,000 soldiers, again, came. They crushed the rebellion, reinstated socialism. It was a little bit lighter than before, better managed, new leadership with a different mind. It was still socialist until 1989. So there was another change. We went back to democracy, and from 1990, we had a democratic constitution, which was changed more recently. After, you know, 22 years of apparent freedom, the country is in deep in debt, not as bad as Greece, but almost. And we have serious negotiations with the IMF, and there's almost a very big social kind of discontent with the way things are. I just mentioned about four major changes in the last 150 years. Why did it not become better? Why? And the answer is in here. The quality of consciousness of not just the leadership, but the general population. So when we talk about dependence, we became dependent on other things than before, but the dependence didn't change. That's the problem. So there must be a change in the quality of consciousness or the clarity of mind. Otherwise, there are no meaningful, long-lasting changes. Okay? So that's why we talk about it. That's why we talk about the root cause. That's why we talk about consciousness. Because if the quality of our lives may not change, nothing changes. It seems to change, but it doesn't. In, in the Buddhism, we call it one angle, going around, around, around. So, revolution, suppression, reformation, new system, then mistakes, suffering, more suffering, revolution, begin again. You will take a few years or a few, or a few decades, same thing. So why are we doing this? Because we don't know any better. But if you practice and you bring out a different quality of consciousness, which is not thinking in cycles or dualistic you know, things, then we can go straight. So when the great teachers only say, only go straight, that means not repeating the same mistake again and again and again in the cycle. Okay? That's why we have to practice, and that's why most people who realize this, they really go inside and try to make things different, try to improve themselves, try to bring about the more wise and more compassionate more consciousness. That's the only meaningful change you can make. That's the only thing that goes with you to next lifetime, if there is a next lifetime. If not, you just have fun. <laughs> More questions? Yes. Uh, my mother's sisters uh, asked me later to tell their children to study because they see their children not having very much interest in studies, rather than famous uh, stars and televisions. Uh, so I tried to have help with them, but uh, like I was trying to s uh, s see through their mind what they are thinking in mind, so I can have some way to have some conversation to make them have some mind to study. But, uh, the only things that I could find for myself was that you can have to like, search in your mind to know what you really want to do in your life and you have to find what kind of course you are going to take in the universe and uh, like, like the only thing I, I could find was that kind of that kind of answer but mm. the, something to help the famous people on television are stronger now Okay, so you have to take them to a trip. Yeah. Just like the Buddha had his trip out of the palace, you have to offer these kids a ride. You don't have to go far. I was shocked many years ago when I was standing in a bus stop somewhere in Seoul. There was a strange noise coming out of the room. And this was a game room. 
And kids after school, they go into this game room and they spend their hours. Their consciousness, their brains are just sliced up by these games completely. So, your sisters, you know, kids, your nephews and nieces, they are attached to these famous people, right? So take them to a game room. Grab them by their hands. No one's going to get hurt. And you can say that in these games there are many interesting and important characters and for them, those who are playing these games, these are the famous people. It's not untrue. They are just exaggerating a little bit. Why? You give them the power of experience. And you take them there and you say, and you say watch this little kid, same age as you, maybe. What happens to his eyes? what happens to his hands, what happens to his speech. And then, before this trip, don't say anything, just say, okay, let's go see something, let's have some fun. So you see this, show them the attachment. Show them exactly what happens. So, the experience is complete. You go home, go to a tea room, and you say, now listen very carefully. These kids, your peers, they were focusing on this game and filling their minds with this game, just like you do with famous people. Can they pay attention to what they actually have to do? No, they cannot. They want the chemistry of their game, the adrenaline, the excitement to control their consciousness. And when that happens, you fall behind those that can pay attention, that can focus on their jobs and studies. And now you can be really like a father figure. You can say, do you want to be famous or just being attached to somebody who is famous? Do you want to be powerful or just being attached to somebody who is powerful? Do you want to be rich or just follow somebody's money? And the difference between that is the quality of your mind, the ability to pay attention, concentrate, and do your job, first of all, as a student, and then as a wage earner. And they will start to believe you. If not, open the door and you say, look at all these people, 12 million in Seoul and 50 million in Korea. Where do you want to be? Which part of society do you want to be in? You want to be in the game room? You want to be in a company? You want to be in an international institution? or in the presidential palace. You must make your choice now. They will start to listen. Just have this love mind, you know, this compassionate mind that you want good for them. You don't judge them, you don't control them, you only want the best for them. And when this love mind inside is combined with this sharp wisdom, then it goes in, all right? self-destruct mode the moment there is some intimacy or there is something which you actually want but you reject right away. 
You have to see this for yourself, really, what it is. And you may need some consultancy or even some people who are knowledgeable about this, human relationships. And I don't want to define the job area, uh, neither Western nor Eastern, whether it's a monk or a psychologist or whatever. But you actually need friends who have very deep experience in this area, and you trust them. Why? Human beings are not rational. We have this logical unit up here, but we are not rational. We are using our thinking sometimes in the most irrational way. Likewise, we have emotions. And these emotions mostly are about you know, associating with others, loving and being loved, but also we can use this really to hate. And sometimes in a nanosecond, the polarity is switched from love and hate. So emotionally, we are also irrational. So we have to come back to this situation of what we truly are, truly understanding what is it that dominates our self, and why, as you say, you hurt those who actually help you or love you <coughs> around that, around this notion. What is the core? What is the kind of paradox in it? So what we call paradox in the West, we call conga in the East. And what's common is that you cannot solve them with dualistic, discursive thinking, or logical systems, or by some emotional pattern, etc., etc. So I'm not just giving this back to you as only you know, because then I didn't help much. But the answer is in you, and you can find the answer if you ask the right question. For that, you have to have some courage and drop down all the walls, cognitive and emotional walls, that you use to protect yourself. Ask the question that goes through these walls. First of all, what is it that I really want with these relationships? What is it that I'm doing to these people? And why is it different from what I really want? If I tell myself that I want to hurt them, do I really need that? What is it that I want from them and I don't get? <coughs> what is it that I get from them but I don't want? So without any logical analysis, see it very clearly in the eyes you know, of a normal human being, and a secular humanist is great. You know? That's enough, you don't have to be religious. And it's not my faith talking, it's me talking. It's different. There is no ideas, there's no beliefs, there are certain people with certain experiences that can help one another. That's it. Okay. So, ask the right question. And the right question is, what am I really doing to these people? What is it that I want and I don't get? And I get, although I don't want it. And now we are touching upon the four smaller kinds of suffering. The four major is birth, old age, sickness, and death. And that's the four misfortunes. And if you deal with Buddhism, you know it the four smaller kinds of suffering that the Buddha also talked about is also very important. Getting things that you don't want, not getting things that you want, being in the company of those that you dislike and don't want, and not being in the company of those that you love and want. So if you look at these four, that applies to your situation right now. And if you use the power of the truth, power of the teaching here, then you can unlock your own mystery inside. You can unlock this paradoxical mind and put everything clearly on the table. What is it that you are doing to yourself and why? What is it that you are doing to others and why? And what's the response? Usually at the central core of all these irrational patterns, there is a wrong view, an ignorant view, which makes it spinning around, 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 around. Just like societies have revolution instead of evolution, human beings, you know, they get to know each other, they get married, it goes bad, they break up, they divorce, and they start sleeping with each other again. Why? They are used to it. So habit force, we call that habit force. But what the habits are, you can only see them with your own questioning, clear mind. So put yourself before your own mirror, and that's that's what I'm that's what I go practicing. Practicing is not just sitting like a Buddha or doing vows or chanting. Put yourself before your own mind mirror, 
and see it clearly what's inside and dare to see it no religion no science no conceptual framework nothing pure awareness without thinking without any dualistic background see clearly what you have inside what you are doing to yourself and consequently what you are doing to other people and this world nothing and no one substitutes it religious behavior especially does not okay. last two questions maybe last one depending on what you ask nothing that's also fine so today we have talked about many important things and I really appreciate the wonderful questions but we cannot produce a solution unless we see our own situation whether it's a lay situation a monk situation European or an Asian situation generally we are on this planet with the five elements we are human beings with the five desires and there is only one way, one solution and one medicine that's your own awakened mind. Nothing and no one else can do that and nothing and no one else can fix it. These Dharma talks, just like all the rest, are about becoming spiritually an adult person beyond beliefs, beyond religions, beyond any ideas. We are all companions on the road if we choose that direction. We can all help each other by practicing together and sharing the Dharma together if we choose to do that. We are not alone, but we are on one single planet. Our situation is not hopeless, but it's very pressing. So there is no delay that we can afford don't have to do anything significantly different on the outside. First, look inside and do the inside job. And as you process your karma and you let go of your anger, desire and ignorance, you become free from the five desires. And everything comes back to balance, your mind becomes more clear. That means you have helped yourself and thereby you become capable of helping all other beings. For that, I wish all of us joint strength and a good journey together. Thank you for your attention.